Hello and welcome to another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Race, your host, and I'm joined by a good friend now, Father Robert Spitzer. And Father Rob Spitzer is the founder of the Marja Center, and it's a great center that is dedicated to really presenting um, science in today's culture and reason um, that goes nicely with faith and faith and reason and understanding how all these great scientific discoveries point towards a creator. And it's quite beautiful how he's doing it. And I highly encourage you to visit their website. Also, uh, uh, they're doing courses as well, Incredible Catholic, some great modules on the on science and the faith. And check it all out at uh, marjacenter.com and CredibleCatholic.com. Now, we are, I uh, hope you're enjoying the Lenten pilgrimage as we are journeying through the Stations of the Cross. We've got Steve Ray as our MC, and we've also got various speakers. Now, um, we're going to talk about today something very relevant to this pilgrimage and, and to this season of Lent, and that is suffering. And why does God allow suffering? So let's cross over to Father Spitzer and talk more about it. Hello, Father. How are you doing? I'm doing great, sure, Bill. How about yourself? Doing really well, thank God, really well. <laughs> <laughs> the COVID situation lifting in Australia there? Yeah, it, yes, that's right. There's no zero cases in New South Wales right now, um, oh, so oh, we're, we're very blessed. It, it, there's no community transmissions as of this recording. <laughs> um, oh, it, might it changes uh, day to day, but uh, yeah. it's been a good run at the moment, quite a few weeks. Great, great. And what about yourself? How are things uh, in the states? Well, it's really it, cases dropped eighty percent. Okay, uh, wow. Cases dropped eighty percent across the wow. nation, so it's really pretty good. Wow. Yeah. Father, um, today's topic: uh, uh, Why does God allow suffering? And it's probably a, a it's a big topic for many people. Sometimes it's a, it's a major hurdle for those who um, are struggling in their faith, and and this could be a blockage for people. If there's suffering in the world, how could a loving God? allow so much suffering? And this is a typical question many have on their hearts and would love to explore this um, with you. So where, where do we begin on a topic like this? <laughs> well, in, in the United States, about 21% of our young people uh, find this to be the most blocking um, problem to their faith. Um, uh, that still is low by comparison with almost 50% Hmm. that consider the science and faith rational evidence question to be the one that blocks their faith. Uh, these are um, mostly Pew survey statistics, but it's a, so it's a huge problem and there's no question. And then it, it also betrays another problem that many Catholics just don't know how to use their faith to suffer well. So I thought, you know, maybe just a few quick thoughts about how do you put your, you know, the context uh, uh, together so that um, none of you, we can see why God would allow it, um, but um, uh, also see, you know, how to use our faith to suffer well. Um, let me begin with the, 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 you know, maybe the overall hermeneutical key here, if I might use a big word, and, uh, and that is that um, everything God does is to get us into heaven. So uh, everything that God permits is to get us into heaven. So the biggest mistake we can make is to think that suffering and love are somehow opposed. Because if suffering can somehow help us to move closer to God, to purify our hearts, to deepen our faith, to deepen our reliance upon God, to, to serve other people in empathy and, and to, to, to do other things that would help us get into the kingdom of heaven, to the extent that suffering will free us to get into heaven, to that extent, suffering would be good and would not be incompatible with an all-loving God. Uh, we might start off, too, with the uh, uh, maybe a, a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is, uh, well, what if God really created us all in a big pleasure bubble? where no suffering was ever possible. There was, uh, you know, he creates us there and, you know, we think about, I'd like a steak <laughs> and you can eat the steak and nothing's going to happen to you if you do. You're not going to get clogged arteries, everything. Eat as much steak as you, you think of, uh, oh, I'd like this other pleasure. <laughs> I'd like it at one degree extra of warmth. <laughs> and just, uh, so we're constantly stimulated. Everything is there for us. And, 
And um, what, what would happen to us? What would our human relationships would be like? What would our relationship with God be like? What would we be like? Well, let's start with that. What would we be like? Well, we'd probably be pretty gross hedonists and utilitarians, and we'd never be challenged to get out of that. There would be no challenge for us to move, um, you know, to some sort of, uh, you know, noble sacrificial uh, dimension of our lives, because everything is just simply given to us, human beings. Uh, being, you know, the, you know, inertial creatures, right? You know, I'm, I'm liking it here in my pleasure bubble. Why should I do anything else? There, you know, I'm, I'll just keep myself satisfied with these pleasures. But something starts going on. An unavoidable suffering would start going on. And the unavoidable suffering would be, I would be yearning for some purpose beyond, right? Because God made us human. God made us you know, to, to strive for something beyond ourselves. God made us for love, which is a striving to make a, an optimal positive difference beyond ourselves. And so, of course, if we're just there in the sufferingless pleasure bubble, what would happen to us? Well, there'd be no striving to move beyond it, but yet we would feel this pain that we have no real purpose in life. All we do is exist to get the next pleasure impulse per second and so forth, uh, you know, the, the basic Jeremy Bentham view uh, of reality. Now, of course, if that were to happen, we would be in utter despair because we really do need a challenge. We really do need to exemplify courage. We really, there's something inside of our very sophisticated being that really does need God. Indeed, would never be satisfied in our lives if we did not have God, if we did not reach out to God, if we weren't in a relationship with God. And relationships of every kind take effort. You, you just can't say, oh, I'd like a perfect relationship, please, because there's two different parties in the relationship. It's going to take some effort. And, and of course, because other people are free agents, there might be some suffering and so forth. So that the idea of avoiding suffering altogether for a sophisticated creature that is seeking nobility, that's seeking to do something positive beyond uh, him or herself, that's seeking to be in a relationship with God, that's seeking to be in deep empathetic relationships with other human beings, that even is seeking to make an ultimate difference to other human beings, ultimate difference to the world, ultimate difference to the kingdom of God, all those things, all the sophisticated desires that we have on what I've called level three and level four um, uh, levels of purpose in life, all those things almost make, no, not almost, they do make suffering unavoidable. And, and so the, the, the key thing is, is, yeah, I think God allows suffering into the world because he knows it's good for sophisticated creatures like us because God knows, obviously he created us. He knows that with these desires to be in a relationship with another free agent, whether that free agent be another human being or that free agent be God or the free agent be the, 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 the community around us or the society or culture around us. Every time we're in a relationship with free agents, there's going to be misunderstandings. There's going to be several. We, we, we grow in these things. And of course, we can't help it. There's ego involved. But imagine this. Imagine that we had no self-consciousness. We had no ego awareness. So God, it, it was going to you know, create us in a world where we say, okay, hey, uh, and there's not going to be any ego, anyone. Egocentricity is gone. Well, the only way of making egocentricity gone in a free agent is to make ego go away. Well, if you make ego go away, you make self-consciousness go away. If you make self-consciousness go away, then we're nothing more than, well, a very nice sloth that's uh, sort of zipping around, but, you know, doesn't really have any consciousness of the world. So, um, unfortunately, you know, because we are the creatures we are, because we've been made in the image and likeness of God,
And because we have not been made perfect from the very beginning, we have self-consciousness, yet at the same time, we can freely choose to misuse that self-consciousness in our relationship with others. We can be arrogant in our relationship with others. And it's not just that, but if we had no challenges at all, no challenge you know, to, you know, in, in, in the world around us, where would we be? We'd never have to prove our mettle. We'd never have to strive beyond ourselves. We'd never have to worry about, you know, you know, even opening ourselves up to another human being, completely self-sufficient that we are. And suppose God said, okay, I'm going to make you perfect beings. You're going to have a perfect, near perfect intellect, a near perfect will, a near perfect everything, right? Can you imagine what would happen if you had all of these fantastic talents, but the egocentricity got hold of it? Your ego consciousness got hold of all these perfect capabilities. We would be a species filled with overweening pride, every last one of us. And we would terrorize each other in our arrogance. And in that arrogance, we create a society that was filled with suffering. Nay, the only way that God could make us, you know, bring us into a, a, a situation without suffering is you just plain have to lobotomize our self-consciousness, lobotomize our free choice, lobotomize our uh, awareness of him, lobotomize our transcendental desires for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being. Because after all, if we desire perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being, and we don't get it satisfied right away, we don't know how to satisfy, there's going to be suffering. Take, rip that out too. Well, by the time you rip everything else out, well, we're just beings that seek biological opportunities and dangers. Love is out of the question. Truth seeking is out of the question. Seeking the good or moral consciousness is out of the question. Seeking religion and a relationship with God is out of the question. Well, wow. we're just going to be turned not into primitives, but into one of the beasts. Wow. Uh, it's so great hearing, um, hearing the way you've um, just sort of gone to the, uh, to the ultimate extreme where we think if we took all suffering away, uh, yeah, my goodness, you just summed it up very well. Um, in yeah, fact, th this, it'd probably be worse. <laughs> so yeah. That's fascinating. Um, I've never heard it being put together like that. And, uh, we, and, and now in today's culture, well, yes, we can change the temperature with air conditioning now very easily and we've got electricity and we've got um, technology and we can communicate with anyone around the world, what the internet, we've got all these things that make our life easier and better and, and to reduce the amount of suffering yet it doesn't necessarily mean we are all happy. <laughs> um, oh, no. Yeah. Phenomenal. What? Yeah, in, fact, I... uh, in, a, in a society where we have the greatest wealth we've ever had and yes. the greatest the climate control we've ever had, you look yes. at all of it and you just look at in 15, actually in 12 years, between 2005 to 2017, this would be in the U.S., we had a 56% increase in depression among young people. We had a 63% increase in anxiety among young people. We had a 53% uh, increase in suicides among young people, 23% increase in homicides among people, young people. And of course, our, uh, uh, the substance abuse problems and the familial tensions are going through the ceiling and our divorce rate is now over 51%. We are not happy. No. All that attempt to get around suffering, but if we just can't control our egos and if we just can't turn to God in our need, if we don't have those two things, if we go ego comparative and we lose our sense of religion, our absolute you know, relationship with God that we feel in the inmost parts of our being, we lose those things. Those statistics are not unusual at all. They mm -hmm. correlate directly with the loss of religion and the increase in ego comparative identity. And of course, Facebook and all these, uh, you know, uh, social media things, you know, they have a good side, but they also have a very bad side that they really exacerbate the ego comparative uh, problem. No, great point. Um, now people are probably wondering, okay, well, they probably didn't think of that. didn't sign up to what you just said there. Uh, well, I'm not talking about uh, little bits of suffering with, with adjusting things like that. I'm talking about major suffering. I'm talking about wars and, and um, all the different natural disasters and, and the deaths uh, 
um, that are happening and, and, and you know, cancer and, and, and people really going through some hardship time, dying before the time's up. How can a loving God allow that sort of extreme type of suffering and why, why on earth would he do that to us? Is he doing that to us? Yeah, well, he doesn't do it to us, but he does, um, you know, of course, let's just say about 60% of evil is human beings causing suffering to other human beings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and let's just say that's, that's a good 60%. And 40% of suffering probably has about natural causation, uh, various kinds, could be an earthquake, a famine, disease, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that, that could be the cause of, of, of the suffering. So the question really is, is, well, why would God allow natural suffering? I mean, you can't blame God for suffering that we and our egocentricity are doing to one another. So that's, that's, that's not right. But if, if you want to say, well, why did God create us in a natural world where there are imperfections, you know, there's going to be an earthquake and so forth and so on. And the, the, the one sentence answer is, is because earthquakes can be very good for our salvation. Earthquakes can be very good for bringing the community together and maybe bringing the community together um, you know, or maybe even bringing our families together, or maybe even whatever it is, you know, the disease, or COVID, right, whatever it may be. Sometimes there are things that are going on in the midst of suffering that are freeing us from an egocentric point of view, that are freeing us to turn to God, that are freeing us to serve one another in kindness, in compassion, to make a difference uh, to one another. Sometimes we can actually, you know, get a freedom to change our whole way of life simply because there's suffering going on in our lives. And the testimonials to this are over the top. People, you know, I mean, I was not always blind. And, you know, about uh, uh, five years ago, my the blindness just started accelerating. And today I am blind. I, um, I'm blind. Now, of course, you could say, well, that's suffering. Um, because, you know, you were able to see and now you can't see what an inconvenience that is. But that is the, half the picture. It is an inconvenience, but that doesn't mean that uh, somehow um, I'm being deprived. And, and uh, what's the blindness done for me? The blindness has brought me closer to a whole lot of people who are, um, you know, um, who I have reached out to and who are helping me. Uh, that is a huge thing. And the blindness, number two, has had a, a great way of just purifying me from all of my arrogance and egocentricity and impatience. I know people think that I'm not an impatient person, but I am an impatient person. I've had to uh, go, you know, I've had to learn you know, to, to be respectful. And, you know, I remember, you know, they, they made me do tutoring when I was teaching calculus in, in, in uh, high school, when I just had graduated uh, from uh, college, you know, I was teaching the calculus class. And then they said, well, you can do also the tutoring for the remedial students. That was a bad idea, you know, because I mean, I just couldn't get why they couldn't get it. You know, and, and uh, now, of course, I get why they couldn't get it. And uh, because all people are not like me, you know, but if, you know, I, I started off as the, uh, the old ego comparative guy. But the, the point I'm trying to get to is, is that all of a sudden you learn empathy for people who are not like you. You open yourself up to God much. My, my spiritual life has deepened hugely since I started having this little problem with my eyesight. And dependency on people. Oh my gosh, if you want some humility, and humility, as St. Paul tells us, is really, really good. Remember that fine passage from 2 Corinthians 12 where he's saying, you know, I, um, uh, you know, he's, he's tell, telling the Lord, you know, I, I gave me an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting proud. You know, you gave me a thorn in the flesh, you know, and I asked three times that you would release me from this, but you saw fit not to. And now I see that in my weakness is my strength. Now, for me, I think Paul was going blind. I, in fact, I have no doubt about it. I mean, why would he tell the Galatians, I know you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me if you could. It doesn't make any sense unless Paul's 
going blind. I mean, I also think, you know, that that thing where he, <laughs> he misrepresents the high priest in the, in the temple there in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, you know, where he goes, uh, what do you have of me, you whitewashed wall? And the fellow says, well, is that any way to talk to the high priest? Now, Paul was a Pharisee. He would have recognized a high priest in an instant, right? He goes, oh, excuse me, sir. I didn't know you were the high priest. Well, uh, how could that happen? You know, unless he, something is. Never thought uh, of that. Off. Yeah. yeah, but I, I really do think the guy, his thorn in the flesh, was blindness. But he sees it's helping him to become humble. It's helping him to become dependent on uh, Jesus Christ, and that's why he says that as I grow weaker. Christ grows stronger in me. So his relationship is, is deepening. He's, he's, he's getting over the proud pride deal. He's getting, uh, you know, more and more, um, you know, related to the Lord in love. And so the blindness is helping him towards salvation and helping him to help others towards salvation. So um, I think, honestly, when I get to heaven, you know, my first, you know, instant, you know, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to go, I'm going to see what would have happened if I didn't have this little eye impediment, you know, and I'm going to go, Phew, thanks, Lord. You know, I really <laughs> needed, it. you know, I mean, honestly, I just know, um, you know, and all of our crosses are kind of designated for us. Maybe not other people, you know, maybe other people have gone crazy being blind. That's the one designed for me. You know, I would have had a hard time, I think, with Alzheimer's, you know, even, you know, my, my last moments before the cognition sort of, uh, you know, went away. And some other people would have had much more of a problem with mobility. And some people have a problem you know, with depression. And, and so I think God sort of designs the, the crosses that kind of fit us best and the ones that we can handle. But I know one thing, if we put our faith in him, He's going to orient every cross that we've got. He's going to orient it toward heaven. Does God cause all suffering? By no means. By no means. God causes, uh, you know, he brings us into a world that has challenge, challenges. He brings us into a world that's going to require courage. It's going to require effort. It's going to require, you know, um, humility. It's going to require uh, you know, a great deal of cooperation with other human beings in a respectful way. He brings us into a world with imperfections, but along with imperfections are all those other things. We got to cooperate with others. We're going to have to get humble. We're going to have to be courageous. We're going to have to exert self-discipline and effort. We're going to have to do all those things that, you know, as a kid, you never wanted to do. Mom, I don't want to do the chores right now. I'd rather not be courageous, thank you very much, if that's going to mean I'm going to get my head punched in, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the point, of course, is, you know, for, uh, for, for all of us, we, we um, you know, we, we kind of don't want some of those things that are going to mean suffering, deprivation, sacrifice up front. But if you look back, you can see that this is what God does. He takes every suffering, doesn't cause them all, certainly doesn't cause human suffering, and he does permit um, suffering to be caused to us through natural forces. But all of it, if we turn to him in faith, I'm telling you, he can use it to get us right into the kingdom of heaven, to deepen our love, to serve others, to deepen our faith. We are totally different people. We turn from superficial and sometimes self-destructive and other destructive idiots. We turn right into people who are so capable of deep and humble love resembling the Beatitudes. And much of that comes from, you know, suffering with faith. Yeah. So my little, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, now, I'm, I, I do, uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying here, where we can, um, we sort of make things bigger than they are sometimes in our mind. I might think, oh, um, so your example of blindness was a great one, and I'm, and I'm thinking of so many friends as well suffering. Um, the, the, I remember the, the name Perusia for our apostolate was um, basically a, a discussion I had with a, a quadriplegic friend of mine who mm -hmm. were, were bouncing ideas around, and then he is quite IT savvy, and he, um, yeah. he coded the first website with his mouth, with a mouthpiece, and I just remember thinking, yeah. wow, I mean, this is amazing. 16 years ago, 
and he's never complained once. I've never he heard him complain once, and you know, um, but he's always joyful and he's always thinking of others. And I'm just thinking, wow, what does he have? And on a simple level, maybe for people to understand this, and then I want to ask my next question. But the idea of um, my, my children, for example, even we, we, it's sort of universally expected. If you want to get fit, you're going to have to go and sweat a little bit. You're going to have to work a bit and train and you train yeah. for the Olympics and, and the amount of effort that these Olympians put in for, for a gold medal is uh, phenomenal. Um, and that's a lot of suffering involved. But uh, on a simple level, I know, say, uh, we rotate in our home um, the chores for the kids. And so, uh -huh. you know, they, what happens is, you know, one might do the dishwasher, the washing machine, um, uh, the sweeping of the floor, you know, the, uh, get the eggs from outside. Um, uh, there, there'll be certain different chores. And what's, what's interesting is some chores, some of the children absolutely hate. It's so bad. They're just like, oh, I can't do this. And, and you see, literally see before your eyes, some are like going through this self-inflicted suffering um, yeah. for something that is for just so simple. It takes one minute. And yeah. then others are like, um, yeah, it, it's easier for others. So it's a real simple example that this is so, it's all in our minds, isn't it? We, we sort of... Um, apply uh, certain tasks or, or uh, attitude towards certain things in life can be really puffed up and blown out of proportion um, and others just accept it, move on, and they're just happy and joyful and free from this burden of, oh, I've got to sweep the floor and, or I've got to fold the clothes or pick up the clothes or do something so simple, these chores, um, and, and for others it could be so painful. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Studying all these other yeah, there's an old uh, adage, uh, something like, uh, you know, 70% of um, unhappiness is your definition of happiness. 70% yeah, yeah, of happiness is your expectation of what happiness ought to be. And if we can just get our expectations more modulated yes. to the point where we just say, well, you know, I should expect, you know, uh, you know, a life that's that's pretty moderate. I should expect some challenges in my life. I should expect that everything's not going to be given to me on a silver platter. And I ought to be grateful when things go right instead of being ungrateful when things go wrong. And if I change the, my attitude, man, we could just wipe out 70% of our suffering overnight just yeah. by changing our whole attitude and, expecta and expectation. Spot on. It ought to be. Father, um, a question about now, God, an eternal being, we are finite creatures. The idea of um, our temper, you know, we, we are here on earth temporarily. We will die one day. Now, the yeah. idea of death scares many people. Um, yeah. However, eternity, um, it is for all. And how does that tr transform, I guess, a deeper understanding or the bigger picture of, okay, um, the suffering that's happening here on earth um, in context of the big picture, of the, of the eternal picture. Um, how can we, I guess, look at that? Um, because, yeah, I mean, Christ himself entered into our world and suffered. And and suffered. I'd like to get yeah. your understanding here on, on um, suffering in context of the big picture um, and how we can really understand it um, for what it is and, and, and not waste it, if you like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember once I was teaching over at Georgetown and uh, – and one of my students just said, uh, this whole thing of death, you know, it just, just drives me crazy. Well, I said, well, you know, uh, in faith, you know, um, we believe that, that life is going to continue on for an eternity. And so we just have to get our choices sort of straightened out, <clears throat> our habits and character sort of straightened out, you know, before death, um, you know, to, to move on to this eternal uh, life um, one way or another. And he said, well, why do you need death? And I said, because if you could put off the choice for an eternity, you would probably do that. But if you can't put off the choice for the, an eternity, you're going to have to make some decisions about whether you're going to go to what I would call a place of light or a place of darkness. If you can't put that off, then <clears throat> we are all forced, every one of us is forced to make that decision come to grips with our lives, to choose what kind of person we want to be. And I'm absolutely convinced that that is why God created death. 
I am sure that he knew that we, you know, I can procrastinate on anything if given an indefinite amount of time to procrastinate. You know, that's a big decision, you know, what, what kind of life I, or character I'm going to have. Well, let me just put it off for a few more years. And it won't do any good at all, especially if we start moving in the wrong direction. So God just basically says, here, I'm just going to give you a, a, you know, a relatively short amount of time. You might get 80, 90 years out of the deal, maybe a, a little few shorter years out of the deal, but you're going to have to make some fundamental choices. You're going to have to define yourself. And that's a good thing for us to just kind of, uh, you know, be able to procrastinate or maybe even take a downward path because we have an indefinite amount of time to choose almost condemns us uh, to taking that, what Jesus would call this wide road to perdition. Uh, so uh, he just basically makes us, uh, gives us uh, some, you know, uh, need um, to, to make a decision and to come to a, a decision of who we're going to be and what kind of person we are and, you know, what kinds of values we're going to appropriate um, before, you know, as it were, eternity begins. And I think death is a mercy and I think death is actually a very compassionate gift, even though it scares uh, the living daylights out of all of us. Everybody has a, a fear of death. So that's, that's one thought I, I do have. Um, and as long as we're convinced that death you know, really is a, a, a closure, at least of this life on earth, certainly not a closure of life itself, if we have faith in Jesus, uh, that's the first thing. The, the, the second thing, though, is is we, we can't imagine eternity. We just can't because it is forever. You know, it's so long. It has no limit. It just keeps on going. And so when we look at eternity and then compare this life to an eternity, right, if you take any finite number divided by infinity, well, it's a flat-out zero. So this life is a flat-out zero because... The eternity is an infinity, really. It's, uh, it's just ongoingness. It never stops. It has no intrinsic terminus ad quem. It has, you know, it's just, just uh, it's uh, literally a mathematics of what we call potential infinity. So, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, this life is literally nothing. So, okay, we've got suffering in this life. That's true. But boy, if we can lever that suffering for all the gifts we can get to help us toward, self, uh, toward uh, salvation and to help others toward salvation, if we can lever our suffering to you know, purification, but well, we don't have to do purification and purgatory, if we can lever that suffering in some way so that we can not only be, be purified, but serve others, help them get into the kingdom, help to alleviate a little bit of the misery of their lives, and, and, and uh, you know, do these things that, that are really truly virtuous, not just in the eyes of God, but virtuous in themselves. If, if we do that, um, and we get some advantage to do that, some motivation to do that, some desire to do that, all of that suffering is good. And, um, you know, there's an old formula, right? Suffering plus faith yields salvation. Suffering without faith yields bitterness and isolation from the world. So, uh, you know, faith without any kind of suffering might be kind of what I call easy faith, easy grace, right? You know, that's the one where I'm never challenged to make a decision, never challenged to do anything with myself, never challenged to make uh, a decision of what, whether I'm going to be a selfish rat or I'm going to be a, a generous a good guy, uh, whether I'm going to be, a, you know, just a sensualist or whether I'm going to be someone who just sacrifices that for the sake of a, of a higher love, of a higher, um, you know, a beyond ego identity and meaning uh, kind of a person. So all these things are very much incited by by suffering and death and, uh, you know, plus faith yields salvation. So any kind of suffering plus faith yields salvation. Faith without uh, any suffering generally is pretty uh, superficial, doesn't get us to the level of meaning in life, self-sacrifice, courage, 
resilience doesn't get us to the levels of having to abandon, um, you know, egocentricity in, in its depths, etc. And that's why I think that, you know, when Jesus was confronted by that Pharisee, he says, uh, not the Pharisees, but the, um, you know, the, uh, um, you know, he, he, the, uh, the apostles where they say, you know, well, wait a minute, you know, um, you know, how come there's these rich people, you know, uh, I mean, the obvious text between the question is, how come rich people have it so easy and, you know, poor people have it so miserable? I mean, what's the justice in that? And Jesus's basic answer is, well, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven. And you look at that and you go, can you be serious? Oh, and some people try to say, well, the eye of the needle is, is one of the gates in, in, you know, going into Jerusalem and the Holy Land. But in point of fact, that's a very typical uh, Semitic kind of hyperbolic metaphor, right? In other words, it's impossible for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. And so Jesus uses these hyperboles, these exaggerations, uses them to say, hey, you think being rich is so good? Well, imagine this. You got all the rich doesn't just mean having money. It means having talents, having status and position, having, you know, uh, respect and so forth in this life. You think that the guy that has everything, the woman that has everything, the beauty, the wealth, the position, the talents, and everybody's fawning over them. You think they're going anywhere? Bet you anything if they don't have faith. And they don't have a faith in Jesus that is really deep. I'm telling you, egocentricity and the eight deadly sins are around every corner. You know, if you take a person who's got everything in this world, they face the challenge, not just of greed, of course, certainly of greed, not just of pride, not just of vanity, but they're going to suffer all the other ones too. Lust is going to be right there too. You can tell that uh, also anger is going to, and impatience are going to be there too. And by the way, it's the richest people who are the most envious. I kid you not. You'd say, well, wait, you got everything. What could he, more could he possibly want? Everything. I mean, that's the whole point. When ego is unrestrained and the eight deadly sins are going crazy, just absolutely crazy, right? Because you've got everything in the world. Uh, honestly, you could be the most miserable of people and not just miserable, but making the lives of everybody else around you miserable because your egocentricity, your arrogance, your vanity is just out of control. The greed is out of control. And I just think of Mr. Scrooge there, you know, in, in that uh, Christmas Carol, you know, uh, of uh, Dickens, which is so wonderful. Anyway, we play around here at Christmas time all the time. But uh, in this Christmas Carol, uh, Scrooge is asked for a donation. These two guys are trying to get some donations for a house that gives food and shelter away to very, very poor people. And Mr. Scrooge's response, if you remember that, uh, is he goes, well, wait a minute. He says, I already give to my charities. And he goes, oh, okay, well, you know, uh, well, what are they, you know? And well, I give to the jails and I give to the poor houses and I give to the workshops. Uh, workshops are, you know, like almost slaving, enslavement conditions. And, and uh, you know, this guy says, well, some people would rather be dead than to go to those places. And Mr. Scrooge goes, ha, that's my point. It'll get rid of a lot of the surplus population. Now, the, the, um, the, the ghost of Christmas uh, present and future, you know, they go right in on him and, um, you know, they buzz him for that statement as well they should. But the point with Scrooge is he's got everything and he does have talent and he does have money and he does, you know, uh, you know, but all of that and he winds up being miserable. Why? Because his girlfriend can't stand him. You know, she, she just basically goes, you know, Ebenezer, you're a nice guy, but I think I'm going to, I'm going to marry somebody else other than you, you know, because I can't live with anybody who's just as obsessed with money and obsessed with power and his own self-image as you are. And so if you really look at what's going on there, the rich man is not generally 
the, you know, we, we idealize the movie star. We idealize the super wealthy entrepreneur. We idealize the football player, the talented person, the beautiful person, whatever. So we, we uh, idealize these people. But in point of fact, if you look at, you know, who's got the drug problems? Who's got the, the, the eight deadly sins problems? Who, who, who's got the highest suicide rates? But what are we talking about here? You know, these are not happy people, right? At the end of the day, if you don't have faith and you've got everything you ever wanted, then Jesus uh, is uh, very likely to be right. Um, it's eye of the needle time. Uh, I mean, camel through the eye of the needle time. It's going to be really, really hard, not just to get it to the kingdom of heaven, really hard not to, you know, be a misery for everybody else around you and really, really hard not to be miserable in your own life. And that, you know, riches won't bring it to you. Talent won't bring it to you. What's going to bring it to you is the faith that leads to compassionate love. That's wow. what will bring us, you know, happiness and love. Amen. That's beautifully said, Father. I just have, uh, I mean, two more questions. And as, as I guess there's a big one. Um, you mentioned the Bible uh, there earlier, and, and I think uh, many people uh, are trying to make uh, uh, grips with the Old Testament. So the God of the Old Testament is all about um, wars and, and, and invasions and floods and all sorts of uh, disasters to punish people and even getting people to do the killing for him and, and uh, all this stuff. How, how can that be all justified? Why would God do that? And uh, the amount of suffering that, that caused those people, the Canaanites or all those others who happened to be cursed or, or, or following um, other religions, how on earth can a loving God be commanding of that? Um, yeah. Doesn't that make him an evil God? Could you, could you answer that one? Sure. There's an old statement and, you know, it's kind of the first statement of biblical hermeneutics, which is like uh, the science of interpretation of a scriptural text. <clears throat> you know, on quid quid recipitor est recipitor and moto recipientes. Uh, whatever is received is received in the manner of the receiver. So um, um, the, the way the Catholic Church uh, looks at it is, uh, uh, you know, that you begin uh, in, in a rather, you know, God has to speak. Remember, God is, is not just dictating, you know, and we will get everything he says. We're always hearing through the words and the categories, the cultural context that we have. Well, in the time of Abraham, right, if you wanted to have a harem, you could have a harem. And you just say, well, wait a minute. You mean God tolerated all these people having all these wives? And, you know, here's Noah, the daughters of Noah are sleeping with Noah. And here's, you look at these things and you go, oh, my gosh, it's just, it's, what could this be all about? Well, pretty much it, it, they're hearing what God is saying in the categories of the culture in, in which they're living. And so if you live in a warrior culture, then you kind of hear God's word. It's not that God is saying this word. Whatever you're hearing, you're hearing in the categories of the receiver, of the hearer. And God has had to work with that all of human history, that we hear him differently. So notice what's happening in Old Testament religion as we move further and further and further down the pike, right? So as we go further down the pike, the, all of a sudden God becomes more loving. God becomes more attentive to individuals instead of just the group, the people, Israel. God, now with the prophets, we begin to hear that God is has said what I meant, right? That God, you know, loves us like, you know, a mother loves her children and, and things of that nature. We're getting almost that super compassionate thing. And then when we come to Jesus Christ, we get to the fullness of revelation, right? So um, the, the idea then is the, the fullness of revelation. Now, let me tell you, the passage from Jesus, and you can kind of, we can begin to talk about a thing called asymmetrical hermeneutics. You know, you cannot put new wine into old <clears throat> wineskins. If you do, then the skins will burst, and the wine and the skins will be lost. 
No, <clears throat> you're going to have to put new wine into new wineskins. Okay, so the main thing to remember here is that what Jesus is saying is, if we're going to try and take the old wineskin, which is the Old Testament categories, the Old Testament um, uh, you know, interpretation of things. Remember, Jesus superseded all kinds of new te uh, of Old Testament teachings, right? So remember in Matthew where he says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? This is the retributive of theology of uh, practically the entire Torah, right? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You take out my eye and get your eye and so forth. What I say to you, you know, you know, love your enemies, do good for those who hate you, you know, turn the other cheek, you know, people are going, whoa, 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 what are you saying here? And, and of course, what, what Jesus is trying to tell them is you cannot hear this message and try to fit it into the Old Testament categories. If you do that, you're going to break the wineskin, you're going to, the, the, the message is too much, those categories can't deal with it. So when the prophets begin to say, no, you, you can't have, um, you know, a, a whole bunch of wives, maybe, you know, just a limited number. And they're, per, you know, they you know, say, well, you know, you also have no divorce and so forth. And I mean, uh, so, some divorce, you know, but, but Jesus is sort of saying, no, I'm saying to you, you know, you, you don't want to have a divorce. You don't want to have more than uh, one wife. You, God created it from the beginning to have one wife and one husband and so forth and so on. Okay. So the main thing um, to, to see though, is that doctrine develops over the course of time when we finally get to the fullest of revelation, which is Jesus. Therefore, you can always look at the Old Testament through the lens and the category of the New Testament. So the New Testament's a big, huge category of the fullness of Jesus' revelation. So you can interpret what the Old Testament means through the lens of Jesus. But if you go around the opposite way, that asymmetry means you can only go in one direction. If you go the opposite way and you try and look at Jesus through the categories of the Old Testament, you're going to be putting new wine into old wineskins. This is not going to work. So in the Old Testament, for example, human sacrifice in the book of Judges is allowed, right? So remember when the daughter, you know, when the, the uh, judge he says, okay, you know, uh, you've rewarded me with all these great victories. Uh, so the next person who comes through my tent, I will sacrifice. Next person who comes through is the daughter. Okay, got a sacrifice here. Now, is that even going to happen in the prophetic period? No, human sacrifice by that point is abhorrent. But that's the way the judges heard that teaching. Now, can you imagine taking the teaching of Jesus, which is, 10 to 100,000 times more advanced than this. And then all of a sudden trying to look at that and say, now how are we going to preserve human sacrifices uh, with the teaching of Jesus? It's not going to work. So just remember uh, this. Yes, there was a time when people thought that they heard God saying, you can have sacrifices. Or, you know, if you get to your enemy's children, you got to just, Kill your enemy's children too. You know, everything, including the oxes and everything else. And you look at those things and you go, well, well, that's what they thought they heard him say. Why? Because quid, quid, whatever is received is received in the manner of the receiver. We can't extricate ourselves from our categories when we're listening to somebody. And if our categories have not been transformed by Jesus, we can't take Jesus and try to jam him into the categories of the Old Testament, which are a thousand times less, you know, um, uh, amenable to love than, of course, the, uh, not a thousand times, but they're, you know, less amenable to love. They're, they, some of them grew up in a warrior society. Some of them, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, take place in, in a society which was very permissive of, you know, <laughs> polygamy and on uh, huge levels, and, et cetera, et cetera. But that was what was there. And so, you know, that's what they heard. Uh, again, you know, we hear in Genesis, for example, you know, I, I do a lot of faith and science 
things. And a lot of people think that, that, that God is speaking to the author of Genesis as if the author of Genesis had no categories, as if he, had, if he wasn't even part of the picture, that God came and just told the author of Genesis, uh, you know, Spitzer, um, here's how it happened. Here are the seven days of creation. But in point of fact, um, God uses the biblical author. So Catholics don't believe in what's called the dictation method of inspiration. Catholics actually believe in what's called a co-participative method of inspiration, where God is working with the biblical author. And of course, the biblical author has his categories. Now, can you imagine if God were to come and give the scientific picture of creation to uh, this poor biblical author? In the beginning was a quantum cosmological configuration when, of course, the gravitational force separated from, you know, the, the string theoretical higher dimensions of space, then it became a general relativistic, you know, space-time continuum. And, and when that happened, then the strong nuclear force uh, rolled off of the electroweak force. And he begins to tell, you know, the, the seven eras of creation in, in physics. Well, the poor biblical author would be sitting there going, what in the world are you talking about? And you go in the beginning was, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, was uh, was light, you know, <laughs> and so forth. So he'd go right back to where he where he was. So the point I'm trying to, to make is we should expect development uh, over the course of time, because we should expect that people hear according to the categories of what they are um, capable of, of hearing within their culture, within their time. And then as we move forward, Jesus is the one who transforms, uh, you know, cultural categories. Uh, and I've, I've got a whole paper on this, you know, where he not only transforms the cultural categories in terms of love, but he also transforms cultural categories in, in terms of individuality. You know, I mean, it's Jesus who says, you know, whatsoever you do to these least ones, you do unto me. I mean, can you imagine imparting his own dignity to a slave prior to Jesus? That would have been a head scratcher, I'll tell you, because, of course, slaves had almost no status. But, of course, and then Jesus, says, you know, children have almost no status prior to Jesus. And Jesus pulls this little child up there, says, you've got to become like a little child. Well, you can begin to see he's blowing up a lot of these uh, socio, uh, uh, sociological and uh, socioeconomic and sociopolitical categories. And he is now saying the individual does have worth. And not only that, but every individual has equal worth. My dignity to look at the poorest of the poor, to look at a person with no education has equal dignity to me, Jesus Christ, which means has equal, the highest possible dignity being made in the image and likeness of God. Well, man, if you go to a societal context before Jesus, that wasn't the case. And, you know, if you try and put Jesus's teaching into those categories, again, you're going to explode the, the old wineskin. So we just have to keep, you know, remembering, you know, do not, you, you can always look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. So your question, I took a long way to get to this no answer, problem. but the, 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 you, you've got the, the New Testament with you now. Now you can take, okay, Jesus's teaching provides the context. How would I interpret human sacrifice in light of Jesus's teaching? And of course you would say, well, that got superseded, all right. Even got superseded in the prophetic period, not just by Jesus, but it got superseded. You'd know that, and you would know why it got superseded, that it didn't conform to the father of the prodigal son, that it didn't conform to the Beatitudes, et cetera, et cetera. You, you would know that there's something wrong with this, that it didn't conform to the unique uh, goodness and lovability of every individual uh, that actually has Jesus's whole identity wrapped up in themselves, irrespective of who they are. So eventually you get, you can see that Old Testament thing that got superseded. And now um, we can let that go. Alternatively, what you cannot do is say, hmm, how will I interpret Jesus's teaching on the Beatitudes in light of human sacrifices? 
<laughs> boom, boom. You've got to, you, you just put the new wine into the old wine skin yeah, and you it's... just blew up both. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we, we only have, we're, we're pretty much out of time and I, I just, I, I can't, I can't let this finish without at least okay. giving um, advice to people who are finding themselves in, in a time of, of, of suffering right now. And many people are suffering in many forms. Mental illness, as we touched on earlier, is, is more common than it's ever been through anxiety and depression. There's loneliness yeah. more than ever. Uh, there's as well as all the physical um, um, types of suffering. There's uh, uh, different disabilities and different all sorts of things. Um, the cancers, the, you name it, the list goes on. And many, many people are, are suffering right now. And it can be a block uh, to God for many people. What? And I, I have to mention the saints because the saints didn't yeah. they did a radical thing by embracing suffering and in sort of enjoying suffering, not enjoying it, but wanting more of it, and taking more of it on, and and never shying away from it. Does it give us a little clue as to what we could be called to as as Catholics and Christians of 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 today? Where we what can we do with suffering? when we uh, actually embrace it. Um, can we touch on some sort of final thoughts here on, on, on yeah, uh, what to do for people today? Um, remember three things. If you're, gonna, if you're suffering right now, mm -hmm. number one thing to remember is what I call the resurrection perspective. Remember, right. God is going to make good come out of this suffering for your salvation. If you trust in him, He's going to bring you to an eternal heaven filled with joy if you trust in him. It's going to help you. It's not just going to help you when you get to heaven. It's going to help you now. It's going to help free you from egocentricity, free you from excessive sensuality, free you from all these expectations that are really completely unrealistic, free you to be courageous, free you to be noble, even in the face of self-sacrifice, free you to do all the things that we say proves our metal, right, that, that makes us to be really, uh, you know, the human beings we, we respect when we respect another human being, right, we, we, we often times respect their virtue, their character, their saintliness. So the first thing is just never l lose the resurrection perspective and your trust in God in the resurrection perspective. Remember what Jesus tells, you know, the father of the girl who died, you know, and he just says it, you know, that, that you know, that, that uh, you know, all this um, depression and, and um, anxiety is, is worthless. What's really needed is trust. So we have to kind of get that into our heads. Fear, anxiety is useless. What is really needed is trust. Number two thing uh, to, to keep in mind, I've got, if you go to the Majus website, and you can take this, put it right on yours if you want. If you go to MajusCenter.com, just go to the fourth landing page, which is growing in your spiritual and moral life. There's a, a, a little article called Getting Started on Prayer. And in there, there are these 12 spontaneous prayers. Just click on those 12 spontaneous prayers, print them out, and carry them with you. I can't go through, but it's like not just help or Hail Mary, certainly those two, but also, you know, Lord, make good come out of whatever, um, you know, uh, of evil I might have done or whatever harm I might have caused, make some good come out of it. Or dear Lord, make some good for me, for others, for uh, you know the kingdom of heaven, come out of the suffering, the crosses I'm enduring. Make optimal resurrection come out of the cross I'm enduring. Or this great prayer, I give up, you take care of it. That's when you're kind of spinning out of control and you're losing it. Or you know, you're in your room, you're feeling all the darkness and you just go, push back the foreboding, Lord. Just push back the gloom, push back the depression. I use my hands, you know, I push it back. And I tell him that about 10 times. And he does, he starts pushing back the gloom. It actually works. So if you just uh, get that, that set of prayers it's called Getting Started on Prayer on the Manja Center website, and just uh, print it out, take it with you. It, they're great prayers to be conduits of grace, real short, easy to remember prayers. Uh, when you're suffering, you just want to bring it up. And the third thing, uh, you know, to, to me to remember is just regular old practical advice. When you are suffering, 
check your expectations for happiness. If you kind of, as you put it so beautifully, uh, Charvel, if you basically get your expectations for what makes you happy under control, you've got your expectations for what is going to make you unhappy. Remember, mm-hmm. about 70% of our suffering we cause to ourselves through the, our expectation that life ought to be otherwise. We exacerbate the frustrations. We exacerbate the dis- disappointments and so forth. And, you know, in, in the same breath, you know, when we get our expectations under control, my other advice is do not compare yourself to anyone else. You know, you don't have it worse. I don't have it worse as a blind person than anybody else. Indeed, it's the the rich man who may have the difficulty of, or the rich person uh, in the sense of talents and all the things that people want today. That might be um, the obstacle that makes getting into the kingdom of heaven like a camel going through the eye of a needle. If we can just remember those things, you know, as we kind of go into suffering, I, I tell you, uh, you, you will get a wisdom that you never expected to happen, a divine wisdom that'll say along with St. Paul, you gave me a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting proud. I asked three times that you would take this from me, but you saw fit not to. And now I know that in my weakness is my strength. For as I grow weaker, Christ grows stronger in me. Salvation grows stronger in me. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Very well put. What a great way to finish uh, this episode. Thank you so much, uh, Father, for joining us and and giving us those words of wisdom. And I really hope it gives some people hope uh, and and a new perspective, I guess, on suffering. And and as we enter into um, these final days of Lent, uh, we hope that people can um, really enter into a deeper meaning and, and, and unity with Christ and, and his suffering, what he's done for us, out of love and, of course, uh, resurrection. We, we know we won't have Easter Sunday without Good Friday and it's going to be part of part of what it is, isn't it? So thank you so much. I know we're out of time. Um, visit just a, an encouragement for everyone. Please visit the website, themargiscentre.com, margiscentre.com. Uh, we'll have the links below. And, uh, and visit and get to know all the great modules and, and teachings and articles that Father has uh, and his team have put together um, and putting uh, some great educational resources out there. Take full advantage of that, please. Hope you're enjoying the pilgrimage. Thanks for joining us on the Perusia podcast. If I could ask you, Father, um, just to close in prayer, as we always do. And please bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all wisdom and consolation, the Lord who is constantly leading you in his love toward your salvation, send his Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire you, guide you, and protect you so that you might know even when the light seems to be being eclipsed by the darkness, even when the doors seem to be slamming, that there are open doors emerging everywhere, that the light shines on in the darkness so that you will trust in him and in trusting in him, come to your salvation and lead others to do so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you everyone for watching and and listening. And uh, until next time, Have a blessed week. God bless you.